Throughout the 1970s, political upheavals began to be noticed by the media. The uprisings in Notting Hill Gate in 1976 and 1977 marked the rising black discontent over policing methods. The discrimination and the deprivation, the sense of alarm and of resentment lie not with the immigrant population, but with those among whom they have come and are still coming. Enoch Powell's sentiments on race were unacceptable. But in sitcoms, racial difference would become the butt of every joke, and the public would embrace Alf Garnett as Enoch Powell's alter ego. <laughs> What's the coon doing here? <laughs> I've given blood the same, sir. What you mean for other coons, like? <laughs> no, for anyone. Huh? You mean they bung his blood into anybody? Yeah, why not? Why not? How do you do? The, I really do get, um, I don't like swearing on television, but pissed off with people who go around assuming that because they are white and English, they are superior to all other races and uh, consider themselves vastly superior to black people. Uh, where all my heroes from the child on were either black or Jewish because I loved jazz and it, to me was my first contact with any kind of art form. I remember I used to tune in to that particular program because I don't think there was anything good on the other side. <laughs> so that was my reason for watching Alpha. I think it I think it did a lot of, a lot it might have done a lot of damage um, in terms of reinforcing the kind of a racist stereotype that, that Alf Garnett portrayed. You never told me you was Jewish. Oh, I, 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 Um, he has so many conflicting and contradictory beliefs. Um, he's avowedly racist, yet at the same time he's Jewish himself. On the other hand, though, I think that the character struck a chord um, with the general public in terms of Alf saying things about race and race relations that weren't considered acceptable within liberal, polite society at that time. I don't want to have to be forced into creating a world that is not here, a fictional world where everything is perfect and which is not. All I'm concerned with is, is looking at the problems that I've seen and, and making fun of things that I don't agree I with. I think sitcoms made racial difference the butt of the joke uh, because of prevalent assumption that being able to laugh about issues of race and race relations would have a beneficial effect in society at large. And that was one way in which the popularity of uh, Till Death Us Do Part and the Alf Garnet character uh, was explained, that uh, the presence of Alf Garnet as sort of Enoch Powell's alter ego would, um, despite appearances, have a sort of beneficial effect in terms of um, promoting harmonious race relations. Love thy neighbor. Kurt, I understand, at a conference that Thames Television had at Brighton where they were looking for new programme ideas, and I think someone suggested it might be a good idea to, to write a comedy show about what would happen if a black couple moved next door to you. into my garden. I didn't throw anything. Well, it didn't fall from a low-flying Alsatian, eh? <laughs> All right, well, uh, yes, well, it must have fallen off the shovel. Well, it just fell back. Young black kids in the school. Um, for the first time on British television, they had some, they had a hero. You know, it's like watching, <laughs> I mean, the I put myself on the same level with Viv Richards and, and Clive Lloyd. Suddenly there was someone who would say, man, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. Let me whisper the magic word. Magic words, yes. Pinky, bonky, 
Hinky, honky. Knee white, honky. <laughs> This voodoo. Is that all? No, there is one other thing. The white man, Eddie Booth, believed that uh, the black man was, ca was casting a voodoo spell on him because uh, he put a, a doll outside, it, hung a doll on his front door, stuck a lot of pins in it, and said he'd cast a spell on him. And uh, anything's possible in a comedy, and, and Eddie Booth believed this. and. Uh, he wanted to get the spell removed, and the black man said, well, the only way you can get this spell removed is to dance naked round a tree. <laughs> matter of nignog and honky and all that rubbish really absolutely steamed us up. I mean, your friends started calling each other nignog and honky, which we banned in our home. We wouldn't have it. It was really, it went too far. And as for dancing around the, the tree trunk with all the paint on and doing that dance, we have good, nice African groups you can bring to do that kind of thing. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Oh, Ali. What have you been doing with yourself over the weekend? Oh, blimey. Saturday, <laughs> I'm going to the palace of Buckingham to see Her Majesty the Queen. But she was not in. Well, there were very few representations of black or Asian people on uh, British television. And when there were, it was very shocking or insulting um, because of the contempt, I think. Um, not that one wanted positive images. It, one didn't want uh, to be hated quite so much. <laughs> I'm going to Browning Street to see the Prime Minister, Mr. Colourgas. <laughs> It doesn't so much provide a transparent representation of what black people find funny, uh, but places black people in a situation where they're there to uh, confirm uh, certain expectations on the part of a predominantly white audience. <laughs> yes, please. He was also not in. Then I'm going to see the Nelson's tomb. Well, I hope he was in. Oh, no. I did not see him either. It hurt us because we had nothing comparative on the other side in real drama to show who we really were. Our personas were being hurt, we were being damaged in this community. Television suddenly dried up. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it was disappointing, especially when I took into consideration that the work I did prior to Love Thy Neighbor. And when you saw your, you know, your, the, the, the white actors who did, um, far less prestigious work than, uh, than I did were just going from strength to strength. Um, and, uh, you know, you started saying, well, is this the same thing that's raising its nasty head again? You know, you saw it happen to actors be proud be before yourself, and it's happening to, happening to me. I felt as though I was being not ignored, but I was being put away. You know, shut up somewhere i um oh yes very painful i i never could keep uh, friends with the people that i w worked with for a long time because i was the one that was not going probably to find another job as soon as that because you'd get you'd phone up and say how are you and they said oh yes well I'm busy doing this I've just done this and I've, I'm, I'm about to do this and that's going to happen to me and I thought well, what's happening for me We will. Hmm, good lines to that one. Look at his eyes. He's not even close to being broken. <laughs> now, 
here's a likely looking hand, a prime young buck just picked from the trees. Bright as a monkey. Good bones, sinew. Wanted free of defect. Good teeth, good for Carolina rice. Virginia tobacco, Maryland corn. Pull like an ox and carry like a mule. Step up, see for yourself, gentlemen. He's free of heaves. Files, French fox. Young, biddable, fine animal, gentlemen. made a lot of people angry, angry, you know, and resentful about what whites had done to blacks. It wasn't so much a series of programs as a, an event, in the sense that that's what people were arguing about and even fighting about in the school playground. Um, I was one of the two black people at my school, and we were both named Kunta Kinte for the duration of that series. It enabled us to locate ourselves you know, to, to answer the question, who am I? And how did I get to be where I am today? You know, um, Roots did that. And it, it, it made us realize that we had a past. We weren't just wild savages running around in the jungle. It had an important influence on me in terms of um, opening my eyes and raising my awareness about the historical experience of slavery, as there'd be very few representations of slavery and colonialism on British television. When I was at school, Jamaica was still a British colony, so we studied English history. The emancipation of slaves in 1834 was worth a paragraph or two due to the humane efforts of William Wilberforce. But we were not told that the fall in the price of sugar had made slavery unprofitable, or the growth of a mixed society in the West Indies had made it unworkable. And we were not told for obvious reasons that black men fought for their own freedom. There was a series in America called Good Times. Um, and Humphrey Barclay, who I'm working for at the moment, decided that he wanted to bring over this series because suddenly there was this brilliant actor called Lenny Henry. Learning how to act, basically, from people like Carmen and Norman and Isabel was such a great discipline because they would tell you off if you were standing in the wrong place or you couldn't remember your lines. I mean, they would really go off on you. And working with Norman was very, very exhilarating because he was he was just so live and on the one when he came on the set that you just had to really run to keep up suddenly it appeared that there were the actors about to take on roles and there was an audience that w was out there that knew black people hi baby sam we got problems well you're really going to have problems if you don't give me some sugar <laughs> hi sam hi Vilma. I see you got your usual ringside seat. <laughs> now look here, Paul. Before you hit me with your aggro of the day, let me hit you with mine. It's been on my mind all day. I still don't like the idea of Shirley going out with this 21-year-old boy. Huh? That don't even make top 20 on the aggro chart. <laughs> Here is number one. This is what Sonny has brought into the house. Sexual behavior in the black community. Honest, Dad, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> you son of a gun! <laughs> Samuel! Ah, uh, baby, you call this serious? A boy his age wanting to know about this kind of thing is the most normal thing in the world. I mean, he ain't a boy no more, he's a man, hallelujah! <laughs> It was quite exciting because it was like the first time that I can remember actually sitting down and watching what I consider to be a black program. Other than that, I remember any time there would be a black person or on television, my mother would come running in and say, quick, Brenda, there's a black person on television, because it was such a big deal. And there was some criticism that the show wasn't all about black people, wasn't being written by, by black, uh, a black writer, quite naturally. 
But at that time, the, I didn't find... Uh, I looked for black artists and uh, black writers. I'd been, I'd been to many of the thea small theatres where black plays were being presented, and I'd met several black writers, um, many of whom now are very successful in the field, but at that time, I'd, they hadn't got the experience um, to do it. Empire Road! It was really a wonderful thing. And then we did the second series where we actually then brought in Horace Ove. So we had a black director, black writer, black actors. And um, that was even more special. There was a certain lady who was in charge. In charge. It was really the, the most uptight person on the thing. And she did not like me whatsoever at the time. And, and when Norman opened the bottle of champagne, it did not pop, right? And she thought, well, that's the end of the whole thing. And she, from the gallery, says, cut to everybody. So the whole damn thing came to an end. And everybody stopped working. And I looked around and said, what happened? They said, um, a certain lady upstairs says to cut. I said, but why? She said, because she thinks that you've, the time is gone and you've lost that shot because it did not work. And that got me very angry because I knew she was being silly. And, and stupid because in the end, um, the, the, the cork came off the bottle, the, the thing was bubbling, and, you, and if she had any intelligence about filmmaking, you could dub in the, the pop. Two days. <laughs> Is your name Linton Samuels? Do I know you? I'm speaking to you, Linton. <clears throat> a few days ago, you beat up my brother-in-law. Short fella. He's been known to stutter. You remember him? Uh, no. The man think we joking, Herbie. You remember him? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Now you know what a turkey feels like at Christmas time. You're a hustler and a pimp. A roach to be stepped on. There's lots of blacks in this town who work hard, but there's guys like you who live well. It's thanks to men like you that some white people call us all pimps. And they have never been able to say why they have not they did not continue doing more Empire Road or why they have not repeated it. And I think it's a, it's a disgrace. Don't trust the media. Don't take television, the press, radio at face value and above all, don't take them sitting down. The campaign against racism in the media is made up of people who work in the press and broadcasting, but the media are too important to be left to the professionals. And they began to pinpoint the responsibility of the broadcasting organizations, the absence of any blacks working in the media, the absence of a rounded picture of black life, the absence of black voices kind of, you know, enunciating their own experience and so on. And that developed into a campaign. It's very much exacerbated in the 70s by the rise of the National Front, and uh, you know, in the campaign, uh, campaigns against the National Front, rock against racism, and so on, and a group of people in the media began to kind of agitate. David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, wanted by the Home Office and the police as an illegal entrant, is actually in a television studio. You are reported as having a message for the people of Britain. What is your message to the people of Britain, I think essentially? One of the main things is that they're not alone, that there are white people all over the globe that, that sympathize with... When last did you hear a television interviewer say, Mr. Fidel Castro, I understand you have a message for the British people. The way that London Weekend came to make skin was really part of a much wider policy. John Burt, who was then running factual programs, took the view that, first of all, 
all television audiences were in some senses minorities. I mean, there are very few television programmes that were actually watched by a majority of people. So there were some minorities, correctly, I think, he's, he believed, which were somehow ignored. Skin tended to focus only on problems, only on defining black and Asian people in terms of their antagonistic relationship to, to white people, so in terms of discrimination, in terms of harassment by the police. So it was what brought blacks and Asian people together was the fact they were non-white, which is a very negative definition of this group. Um, and what, what we discovered, as I discovered, was that the Asian community was much richer than that. They had a much greater experience than simply their real experiences of discrimination or hassles with immigration authorities. And what they really wanted was a programme that reflected a wider range of their activities. Today, we're going to try to discover the extent of the racial violence that's broken out all over London, why the attacks happen, and what's likely to be done about it. Monday night, three months ago, they came to the, our shop, the skinheads, about 100 of them. And they, they throw the bottles, uh, knife, stones, to the, our window, shop windows. We was trying to save the windows. They just come to make trouble. So we've done nothing wrong to them. Hello, welcome to Ebony. Between now and Christmas, we'll be keeping you in touch with what's happening in Britain's black communities. Music, people, news, sport, drama. If it's happening, it'll be in Ebony. That half hour magazine slot gave access and humiliation. It gave access because it was a chance to have black stuff on, but to the extent that everybody wanted to stuff shove everything into it, it disappointed everybody at the same point. It was like you were being set up in a space that was bound to frustrate you, was bound to make you in the, in the long term look bad. Yeah? Gradually, this was recognized by the black folks who were working in it, happy to have the chance to work in TV and so on, but also frustrated uh, to, to, to the point which they were saying, we've got to break out of this half hour stuff. We've got to actually kick some, some, some more doors in. But for many people in Brixton, such massive sums pale into insignificance when compared to what all this has done to the already strange relations. I think Channel 4 was, you know, a, a remarkable break. There's no question about it. In British television, it's one of the most important uh, breaks that there is. <laughs> Operated himself and he hated his job. He was afraid on the streets for me. So he took it out on her and she couldn't bear it. Such failure. Such emptiness. A lot of us who were involved in the Channel 4 campaign couldn't believe our eyes. <laughs> we, <laughs> we designed this remit to represent uh, minority audiences of all kinds. It came into existence at the same moment as Thatcherism. And I still don't understand why it wasn't strangled in its bed. You know, everything else was, so why wasn't it strangled? But it wasn't. Uh, and I think there must have been, you know, there must have been as a result of a whole range of developments in the 70s, an awareness that really, you know, it was, uh, there were too many excluded voices from mainstream television. We wanted those programs to be seen by everybody. It wasn't just a community, a minority in the community talking to itself. It was supposed to be the minority in the community talking to all of us. But actually, I think that was, that was nonsense, really. The, essence of the matter was giving people a chance to say something to each other. Good evening and welcome again to Eastern Eye. <laughs> the 
the dominant consideration in my mind was that these programs had to be about our community's experience speaking in its own terms. They weren't about explaining us to white people. They weren't about primarily our conflict, our relationship with white people. They were about our lives. In these nice terms, it was a lot to do with films and film stars, which is a very important part of their life. And so we both decided what we needed was a program aimed at, the, at these groups, but which had a wider brief, and which is why we split them up, and not just a brief defined by the fact that they were not white. Mrs. White, what do you think well, you should do next? What we're going to do next is tell the minister, I can tell you, we, when we go back in the health service, we went on one week strike, one week strike and no emergency cover. Would you like that? Well, well may I just say that, that if that is what you have in mind, oh, yes. don't, don't have regard to what I would say about that, don't have regard to what Beverly or the other yes. uh, people in the audience as ever, just think about the patients. For a year of my tenancy, in Channel 4, both Black on Black and Eastern Eye were run, funded better, and championed by me. Secondly, uh, the second notion was that they were extremely popular programs. That is not so. Their viewing figures in that series fell. What I think was a, a problem and a disaster, really, was the decision to take away a flagship, rock-solid, black program that was there week in, week out, which people knew and could find in their week's schedule. Because what that then did was take away one of the things that black people don't have in this country, an institution. It was my job now as second commissioning editor to try and build the black independent sector. In other words, take the money away from LWT and give it to somebody else, or give it to lots of other people. Most of the little companies that got a break have now folded up and disappeared, and, and there are more white companies run doing black things, and, or the way they uh, think it should be done. And um, I, it hasn't happened. She knows I'm in here talking to you. The fact is that Angel is expecting. What? Oh. She's heavy. Uh, <laughs> Angel! It can't be! Your rubbish are contagious, oh, this boy. is just the kind of over-emotional behavior I was trying to avoid. <laughs> now, look, I'm going to bring her in here. She's been living in Brighton for these past few weeks, I might add, with the full knowledge of Cousin Melba here. <laughs> of the Lord, you know. And him say, Melba, go and buy yourself some Nigerian stamp, go down to Africa house and buy some postcards. Fantastic, Cousin Melba. So you came in every morning, hey, great, what's going on, what's going on? You looked at the script, said, yeah, OK, OK. No, 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 don't like that, don't like that. You had control in what was going on up to a degree, and that's something, as an actor, you never have. You come in, you're employed, you do your lines, you go home. But you came in, you looked at the set, you went, rubbish, ain't having that. Move that, move that, take that out. And that was nice. <laughs> In terms of its representation of uh, black family life, it tended to reinforce the often prevalent assumption that black families are inherently disorganized um, due to lack of parental authority. And in that sense, perpetuated, I think, some of the less favorable images of black domesticity that first appeared in sitcoms like The Fosters in the mid-1970s. I want to do more with my life than just have children. And so do I. I'm not going to be a shop assistant forever. So, uh, what do you want to do? I've got to find out. I didn't want to be either this mad woman on the soapbox all the time or um, a person who just arrived in this country. I mean, there was just so many contradictions. The joy about being in a soap opera is, is having the sort of continuity and the time to develop something in, in almost a sort of linear way. But my character was so stop-start the whole time. Um, and it was because it just depend, depended on who was writing the script. 
you cannot just have black actors and hope the situation would be rectified because you're fighting a situation on your own. You can say that you personally do not think that this is right and you, if you have enough time, the director will address it. But you're on a short space of time and so it goes like and you've got to move quickly. If you've got, and I don't mean a black director because I think it's horrible to have a black director or a black writer because you're still on your own. You need a couple, a couple of black writers, a couple of black directors. It will be put in perspective by the mere fact that they are black. <laughs> First, I wanted to do six half-hour um, comedies where I played a different character each week, but it was decided, not by me, it was decided that that was too kind of risky, and people were used to seeing me in sketches, and, um, you know, maybe I should carry on doing sketches. Bearing in mind, I've been doing sketches since 1981, really. So I went into another sketch show called The Lenny Henry Show, and this was a, this was a breakthrough, a huge breakthrough for me, because it was like my own series, and and plus the alternative comedy thing had happened, so I changed my style as a comedian. Three reported sightings of your car? Yeah, being pushed into a canal, being hit by a steamroller, and one of it being driven off a cliff by a World War II Japanese fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my listeners are severely deranged, Winston. Yeah, I bet they're only joking, though. Well, two of them, maybe. <laughs> Come on. Hey, 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 not so fast. He's talking to your brain, Winston. <laughs> The geezer over there reckons he's a friend of yours. He's expecting you to pay this for him. £38.75? I thought you said geezer, not coach pie. Because he's a, clearly an outspoken advocate um, working to support the practice of blacks within the industry as writers, as performers, and as technicians and directors in a range of different roles. And I think that he's been very, very forceful um, in, in, in developing that work and using the power that his unique position uh, has, uh, has given him to, to develop that struggle inside the industry. Of course, Johnny did all the physical work on this. You're fond of that boy. I wish I could do something more to help the other deadly children like him. And you're tired of work. It's time I became a holy man. A Saudu of South London. Yes. But first, we must marry Umarov. Well, I just wanted to write about what, what life seemed to be like around me, without the constraints of, any, of, any, of anybody saying we must be represented positively or whatever. Um, and it was a time when it came out of, I suppose, my thinking about the 70s, which was to do with uh, the fragmentation on the left into the gay movement, into the women's movement, into the black movements and so on. And those elements, I think, seeped into the laundrette. See you later, everyone. So, Maggie, is this the place you're going to? This paradise garage? Don't tell me you're into all of that nastiness. What nastiness is that? This gayness thing. Who's introducing you to those places? It's the club Gary Louise and I go to. I bet Comrade Tony said something. I can just imagine what you've been saying about Gary. And when he comes, it's, what happened, Gary, right? You hypocrite. Listen, Mags, that just asked me Don't what kind of club... Don't bother to tell me. I can guess. Anyway, I haven't got time to listen to this. Come on, then. I think the fact that black filmmaking in the 1980s was able to address issues of race, gender and sexuality in a way that mainstream television was not is an interesting 
reflection of the very ambiguous relationship between cinema and television in Britain. Um, I think there are a whole range of uh, cultural, moral and ethical um, assumptions that regulate what we see and what we don't see on television. And in particular, when we think about representations of black people in drama, we tend to see a very narrowly problem-oriented discourse. Tomorrow, Nam Kia Hai. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't speak Indian. Superintendent Saab ka jawab do na haram jate. Do nahi? Jaldi jawab do. Look here, doesn't this man understand? It's no use talking Indian at me. Sister Ludmilla, is there a room where we can question this man? Question? What for? Mr. Kumar, these are the police. They are looking for someone. It is their duty to question anyone we cannot vouch for. And last night, we found you in a ditch. Now, what is so terrible in that? Except hangover. Come, to the office. That's your name? Kumar? No, but it'll do. The images of colonial life in the Raj revival films are very much from the, the colonist point of view, the white point of view. You'll often find that the black characters are seen through white eyes even if they have parts and, and, and the roles to play, that it's very much an exercise in a, in a post-colonial society, a society that once had an empire, was head of an empire, actually reflecting on and trying to re-examine its own colonial past. Still to the end of empire, um, and this was a desperate attempt to reconstitute the past, but also an attempt to, to create a British identity then, now, um, even though they were set in the past. And of course, um, it didn't really work. Star girl, man, star girl. <laughs> All right, we're going straight wrong. Now, look here. I don't want no wild shit. Just play steady and we got this thing under control. All right? Are you two ready? Yes, ma'am. OK, OK, let's go, let's go. All right. Richard's finished. Right. Viv Richard. Right. <laughs> so funny, brother. <laughs> go on, boots. Come on. Let it up, boy. Tell them about the Brixton party! Films like uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, um, Sammy and Rosie Get Laid, or um, Playing Away, which each proposed a version of Britishness, British culture, and what it meant um, to be part of a British national identity uh, that fully accepted the transformations that black culture had brought about in the post-war period. And I think Playing Away uh, dramatizes that in terms of the cricket game as a metaphor um, for the post-colonial situation in which Britain found itself in. I got interested in, in, in um, playing away for exactly that, the metaphor, and that using cricket, as you well know, cricket is the one game that the West Indians are very proud of and very good at and it's the one game that they know that they can beat the old masters at. Well, I think the main thing that most people who look back at the era, at the beginning of the 80s, when looking at black workshops get wrong, is that they look at them solely as a product of the riots of 1981. And that's only partially true. A lot of the members of the Black Workshop, Sank Over Film Video, Black Audio Film Collective in particular, were products of going through a higher educational system of learning. We felt that that necessarily gave us the, the possibilities for raising questions which were, up until that point, unacceptable questions to raise within black circles. You know, we felt that given the fact that we armed ourselves with these theories and these ways of looking at the world, we could literally come out and wash dirty linen, you know. Uh, I'm not sure how well we did <laughs> when it came to that, but that was certainly the impulse. The impulse was to, to come out and function largely as a sort of dissident voice, you know, both within and without the black communities. Black filmmaking has just kind of imposed itself as an important thing in the history of British cinema. That is, I think, entirely due to that intervention, to create just two or three independent spaces where people could define their own terms of working, etc. I think the criterion that the, that the workshops had, of both 
trying to give people experience of working in the media, of breaking through to the mainstream, but of also looking outside at the other audiences, you know, at the films that might reflect their life and be used in discussions outside. I think that double requirement has been very important for the work, Charles. It's about time we had our own child, our own Master George Hammond Banner Bart. That night, I moved from an idea to a possibility. I was born in a moment of innocence. Mr. Nishal, what's your assessment of what was the cause of the riots here? Well, you're asking a million dollar question. Something does seem to have gone seriously wrong somewhere down the line, doesn't it? Well, Again, you're asking me very uh, serious questions. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, uh, there was a day before, it was a very nice atmosphere. I was there, you know, I, watching people, enjoying themselves. And suddenly something has come up. Part of the problem with television is that it doesn't have a memory. It finds it really difficult to historically chart events, you know, so that if blacks rioted in 61, by the time you get to reporting, you know, black events in 71, nobody has any record or sense of, of what 61 meant, you know, and so we wanted to find a way of just building a memory of black presence into how we talked about 85. Welcome to Black on Europe. dozens and dozens of programs kind of trying to sort of look at and show to the wider public different aspects of immigrant life in Britain. And in some ways, that kind of attitude still exists to this day. And this need to kind of use this, you know, television, use this medium simply to inform the wider public of these new aspects of British life in Britain. Tonight on Bandung File, we hear the voices of Asian women who describe how Islam affects their lives in this country. If we look at how um, things have developed since the uprising, say, in the 1980s, we can see lots and lots of factual programmes, but you don't really see black people being having a chance to make um, one-off dramas or um, full sort of soap operas or things like that. So I think it's like seeing black people, and especially black women, being given the opportunity to really tell their stories in fictional ways. If you do documentary, there's always this slightly hip idea that if you're onto a black case, you know, you're onto the living case, the real case, you know, the city case. Um, and I think people on the whole seemed okay when it came to documentaries. There was always a problem with, with drama because when we talked about drama, we were, we were not just asking for the right to, to exist on television. We were also asking for the right to change the rules of television. Whatever happened to the dream deferred? Whatever happened to the dream deferred? Well, things haven't changed much. We still find I wondered as you wandered, and I've seen how far you've come. Though history's forgotten names, your name will not be one. Is there a life that you've hidden? One you felt was forbidden. We're seeking what's true. Once you begin to actually discuss drama, then you come into the whole area of entertainment, pleasure, 
more than simply informing, but also kind of doing other sorts of things. And I think it's actually very difficult for program makers to shift into that frame of thinking. And it has been, and I think it's the kind of area that we need to actually begin to debate and open up much more uh, strongly than we have done. The generation of black writers, I believe, has, to put it very simply, been disencouraged by political mafiaism. A belief gets around that the only thing you ought to write is something that will help race relations or something that will represent somebody. And the critical criteria you place on yourself become a kind of Stalinism in the mind. They try and police you and you are then supposed to write out of a ghetto of criteria which please other people. If you are seriously committed to the idea of opening up the institutions and getting black lives in there, then you need to be hip to the idea that you need a range of black voices to deliver you that. And I think that sense you know, of accepting range uh, or accepting variety hasn't sunk in. I mean, I think people still think that what you need is to just round up a group of unemployed black filmmakers, march them into the BBC, you know, uh, all into the current affairs department, and somehow, hooray, everything would change. You know, I think you need a lot more than that. And I think this question of, of access to power is still the most important one, because it's still white male executives making programs that they think black people will enjoy, rather than than black and Asian people actually being high in the power structures themselves, being able to commission and make programs that they know will appeal to audiences that they understand. And as long as we don't have that breakthrough, we're still going to be in a sort of semi-colonial or patronizing uh, situation. To a point, uh, a black producer or executive producer or commissioning editor as head of drama at Channel 4, to my mind, would be infinitely more significant than having a multicultural department, however well that department operates. Yes, it's quite clear that there ought to be more black executives uh, in the BBC and other, uh, and ITV and so on. And I would hope that the BBC's targeting initiatives um, over the next five, ten years will set that right. Although it would be idiotic of me to pretend that that's something which is going, to, there is going to be radical change in the near future. The day that I would be really looking forward to is when they say there's a young black person and they want to do a Wild at Heart 4 on television. That would be when I would know we've really arrived because I know that we've really seriously permeated the institution to the level that people would even accept black esoterica, you know, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs>